Great. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, and thanks. We got started a few minutes late. Uh, my apologies. My name is Beth Kuchar. Um, I'm the chairperson at uh, Innovate Pasadena. And um, we host these Ask Me Anything sessions every two weeks, just a quick 30 minute lunchtime session um, to share some of our experts knowledge with you guys. And uh, today, actually, um, we want to welcome Ken Funahashi, and I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen here with everybody so that, so today we're welcoming Ken, um, and Ken actually recently joined the Innovate Pasadena Board of Directors, and he's also a member of the Pasadena Angels. And he's a partner at Wilson Sonsini, where he focuses on corporate finance, including, among other things, startup companies obtaining financing. So uh, I want to welcome Ken uh, here today to answer your questions. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much, Beth and Kaya. And it's an honor to be here and uh, looking forward to, uh, to interacting with the audience. Great, so maybe you could give us a few words about your background and some of the things that you focus on. And I know we had three questions that our audience members who are joining us today actually asked ahead of time. So we'll have you run through those, but anyone else in the audience, feel free to type a question into the Q&A. Certainly, just by way of a brief background, uh, it, again, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm a resident of Pasadena and I'm so excited about the, the Innovate Pasadena organization as well as the Greater Pasadena uh, Innovation and Ecosystem. Um, and, and so uh, I'm so glad that uh, you could join us today. Um, by way of a brief background, um, I'm a, a Midwestern at heart. Uh, my, my parents are from Japan, but I was born and raised in Wisconsin. Uh, moved out to uh, Southern California in the mid 90s to start my law practice and my law practice was was uh, principally anchored on representing companies as they were um, uh, raising their first round of capital to raising their first venture round to ultimately going IPO or, or selling uh, to a strategic acquirer or to a private equity firm and so I've been really pleased to work with some really amazing entrepreneurs over the years uh, who ha and witnessed um, them, you know, ideate uh, from a concept uh, all the way to a product, all the way to an exit. Uh, and so uh, to the extent that I can be helpful uh, with any of the questions that you may have, I'm very happy to, to share. Uh, just a quick caveat that this um, should not be construed as, as legal advice, but I'm very happy to share some overall perspective on what we're seeing in the, in the financing markets and, um, and, and, uh, uh, and, and the innovation ecosystem here. And we have our first question that was asked in advance up on the screen. Well, that's great. I'll, I'll read back the question. It, it, the question is the pandemic forced businesses to pivot. For some industries, new businesses couldn't grow as planned while others were able to ride the wave. What trends have you noticed from startups looking for funding? A very good question and a very timely question, particularly as we're now in the first quarter of 2021, uh, still in the throes of, of COVID, but uh, with, uh, with a light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Uh, and so, um, you know, certainly maybe looking back at, at, uh, at 2020, uh, March is when we really start to, to see the impact of COVID on the companies that we work with and, and the investors that we work with as well. And there was a, a moment uh, of time where um, uh, a great uncertainty. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, funding activity decreased overall. Um, but as, as people started getting acclimated to the new normal, uh, which consisted of um, a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of virtual meetings, um, and, uh, and, and businesses pivoting to, uh, to accommodate to their customer base, perhaps not as much in person, um, you know, we, we actually, and, and, and obviously spurred by, you know, uh, a significant amount of, of support uh, from, in the form of stimulus and, 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 and loans from the government, such as PPP, uh, we, we saw uh, funding activity and uh, entrepreneurial activity, you know, roar back to life in, in the second half of 2020, uh, which, has con which has continued at a, at a very um, brisk pace uh, through the first few months of, of 2021. 
Um, in terms of startups, you know, our world tends to focus primarily on venture track, life sciences companies and tech companies that are, um, you know, that are either, you know, developing um, innovative technology relative to, let's say, you know, uh, oncology to, to COVID um, or to, on the other hand, to, to technologies such as software and, um, and, and uh uh, some some consumer products and some consumer retail technology as well, uh, and so um, so maybe I, I could preface this by saying that uh, COVID affected startups very differently based on the industries in which they they were they were based, and and, and so um, you know I would say for startups and, and really every business in in some sense is a startup, and and so for for many of our our friends who run restaurants and 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 uh, cinemas and things that really depended upon foot traffic i would say that that is last year and, and this year has been a very challenging time and so so our heart certainly goes out to them and uh, and we're very you know we remain optimistic that you know as as the vaccine starts to get deployed um, there'll be a lot of pent up demand for for those who wish to go back to restaurants for those who wish to have communal activities such as, you know, going with their friends to a movie, going to uh, location-based entertainment, for example, uh, an amusement park or, or um, you know, anything that, that involves a group, concerts and so forth. And so I think that that remains to be, um, you know, a, 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 an industry or an industry vertical that has been significantly affected by, by COVID. And, and, you know, traditionally speaking, um, that vertical doesn't, um, Necessarily look for or seek venture financing uh, because they'll they'll bootstrap off of their own revenues, off of their friends and family, uh, or uh, you know from lines of credit from from banks and so forth. Um, so so that's the the first vertical if we were to look at at startups. I think the second is in the area of small businesses, and these small businesses could be services businesses. They could be you know law firms, accounting firms, you know advertising firms, and so forth. And so um, I think it has been an adjustment period. I think certainly working from home uh, for anyone in the services sector has has posed both challenges and opportunities. I think the challenge is the connectivity or the tissue relative to uh, to the team. Um, the opportunities are, um, you know, are, are that there's there's much better technology today than there were, let's say, 20 years ago to facilitate online interaction, uh, whether through their own whether with their own team members or whether with their customers or with their strategic partners. And so, um, you know, in, in that vertical, um, you know, it, it, it has been challenging, but uh, I would say that, um, that, you know, technology has really helped facilitate, um, you, know, uh, you know, running the business in, in as much of the normal course as possible. Uh, also in that area, you know, funding for startups has been traditionally non-venture track um, and therefore non-angel non based. Um, now looking, now pivoting over towards um, startups as as we as we consider them in the life sciences or the technology space, I would say that for in the life sciences area, um, and this is a generalization that uh, for the most part, um, you know, it, it was business as normal in the sense that um, a uh, for many startups the primary funding source are government grants, and so that grant uh, activity you know continued. Um, B that for uh, for life sciences companies, um, you know, before they they're in a position to attract venture capital, uh, they have to bootstrap with with friends and family and with grants and so forth, uh, and and with angel investors. And and I think if if anything, COVID was a reminder to uh, those who are passionate about the life sciences space that um, you know these technologies really do matter. They do do have the ability to to save lives to, and and to help people. And so. Um, so I think, uh, if anything, it it, it maybe uh, pointed the the microscope or the or the magnifying glass onto the life sciences sector, um, and and we found both from a startup perspective as well as a later stage perspective, um, there to be you know the funding uh, the funding flow has has continued to be quite active in that area, um, and um, you know although at at a startup level you know with with any life sciences company given the capital expenditures required to file the patents to to be able to. Um, to go through the regulatory process and, and so forth, the cap the capex intent involved in life sciences, particularly when there's they're, they're, they tend to be pre revenue. Um, when we're talking about small molecule biologics, um, there's always a challenge of of any entrepreneur trying to bootstrap their way towards an inflection point where they can either raise venture or they can go public or they can uh, get acquired. And so 
uh, some of the same you know uh, challenges prior to COVID I think remain during COVID, and and those you know and and the access to capital I guess I've heard different stories that some entrepreneurs have said that it's a much easier to get to talk to investors and to strategics now because in the past they would have to go to conferences like JP Morgan, you know have a one on one in person. Now there seems to be a more willingness for for strategics and for investors to do Zoom conferences in lieu of of one on one meetings just by virtue of necessity, and and I'd probably say that's that's the um, um, that that's kind of maybe the, the silver lining associated with uh, with the post COVID world. Um, in, in terms of med tech and in terms of um, digital health, I, I'd probably say digital health has has been a good beneficiary because now uh, just by virtue of our not being able to go to hospitals. Um, you know, uh, digital health technologies has enabled and accelerated uh, large institutions as well as patients um, to to adopt new technologies to be able to 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 to, to have you know their healthcare needs attended to. Uh, and with medical devices, I think that also is a capital intensive sector. And so it, you know, it's a little bit of all of the above relative to some of the challenges associated with fundraising as well as um, you know some of the the funding opportunities. Maybe in the last vertical, um, in terms of technology, um, technology broadly speaking can be can be um, you know devices like you know um, our, our phones and, and and consumer products uh, all the way to, to software. And so uh, so maybe just focusing on software itself, um, I, I think for software or for platforms that really facilitated e-commerce, that facilitated online interaction, that facilitated social interaction. And that also facilitated um, distributed entertainment, whether it's through, through video games, through media, or otherwise, uh, quite expectedly, um, by virtue of everyone being stuck at home, those technologies really uh, took off last year. And, and, um, and, you know, and, and as a result, investors were very interested in investing in those spaces because of the metrics that, that those companies had posted. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that if that emerges into a permanent shift in in behavior in consumer behavior as well as investor behavior. Um, I think traditionally, you know, investors um, had you know always been interested in let's say software companies because of the ability to to scale um, software. Um, and and now I think we're 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 continuing to see you know uh, investors focus on on the software sector. Um, technology, I think, you know, it, it really depends on the specifics of the technology, um, and, and so, um, you, you know, but but no matter how you look at it, from all of the different industries that were were touched upon, and and, and that's not an exclusive list. And there are many other different uh, technologies, industries, and startups that I didn't cover. Um, you know, I, I think the overall, um, you know, the overall um, takeaway is that. Uh, yes, I, I think for 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 the vast majority of, of companies, it, it's been a challenging funding environment. I think assisted by uh, government PPP loans and and uh, and bootstrapping. I, I think for for some uh, startups that um, were either um, uh, providing solutions uh, for, uh, for 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 COVID vaccine for um, for PPE, you know, uh, uh, things like masks and so forth. There was tremendous demand, um, and for software that enabled um, remote communication, remote entertainment, and remote social networking, I think that user engagement definitely increased. And so, um, yeah, you know, the thing that's really uh, exciting as well is that many of the companies that I just mentioned that are quite promising are in the greater Pasadena area. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that that's a, that's a very exciting trend line. It's, it's and it's always nice. We're we're walking distance from. Uh, Old Pasadena, so it's nice to see that many of our our, our restaurants and stores have, have reopened, um, and uh, and 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 there's a lot of foot traffic there as well. Excellent. Well, I, we do have a couple more pre-asked questions, but we have a question from um, our live audience right now. Uh, Larry asks, "Have there been any shifts in the types of financings being done?" SA SAFEs, preferreds, convertible notes. We seem to be seeing more SAFEs and more inquiries about inventory or AR financing and other forms of senior debt. Curious how broad-based this is and if new investors are surfacing, such as venture debt funds. That is a fantastic question. And, and uh, it, it may be that Larry, Larry and I know each other, um, but the, the um, 
so, so it's a it's a very good question, and I think um, it, maybe it's similar to to uh, the the response is going to be as broad based as as the prior question, which is to say, um, uh, I, I think for for those companies that are venture track, uh, for those that you know are software life sciences based that want to become billion dollar unicorn companies. Um, th there is still a very attractive kind of um, uh, funding environment for startups. Um, having said that, though, it is very important uh, for any entrepreneur to assess whether or not that is the entrepreneur's A, desire, and, and B, um, you know, whether they want to take in outside capital. Because venture capital and angel, invest angel capital and, and public markets aren't for every entrepreneur. I've seen many entrepreneurs bootstrap their way into very, very successful companies that uh, that they continue, you know, for for their lifetime. Um, sometimes they they hand them down to their to their to their kids and so forth. And so, um, you know, so when we look at um, you know a startup and, and we look at the trajectory of a startup, um, you know, the venture track is a very very specific um, um, pathway, uh, and it's a pathway that uh, involves a very a very very accelerated growth. Um, you know, uh, a lot of capital consumption, therefore necessitating third-party capital, uh, and um, and a technology or a product or an innovation that investors believe can scale very quickly. So, under that hypothetical, where there is a technology that uh, can scale very quickly, that can be you know can, can attract um, investors and and ultimately an exit through an IPO or an M and A. Um, safes have become more popular. Now, what a safe is, is called a simple agreement for future equity. Um, it, essentially, that was an instrument adopted in Northern California by, uh, by, by, by an accelerator to, make, to reduce the friction associated with taking in funds at the very early level. Now, now safes have really not been tested in a recession. Uh, like, I don't, I, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty new instruments. And so, as a result, um, you know, in Southern California, we, we, we haven't seen safes employed as much as in Northern California, um, in part because investors are either A, not familiar with it, or B, not comfortable with the, um, with the lack of protection, for example, that a safe may provide that other instruments like convertible debt, preferred equity, um, secured, um, secured debt uh, can provide. Because a safe essentially is saying, hey, you know, here's an interest-free, maturity-free, um, loan, um, if one wants to characterize that, that converts into preferred once the company raises its, um, you know, it's, it's either institutional or, or preferred round of financing. So safes, I think, have been become much more popular nowadays. I think it probably correlates to uh, the time that the safe has been around, um, the the fact that it's, you know, that that um, that it's been successfully employed um, both in Northern California as well as in Southern California. Uh, as well as um, you know, and as well as the fact that there's just a, a ton of capital um, um, chasing a, a very few companies, and so the companies have some degree of control over the types of instruments that are most favorable to them. Um, so, but but safes again are are not a great instrument for investing in a company that doesn't plan to raise its next round of financing, that doesn't plan to go IPO, that doesn't plan to do a an exit anytime soon, because the investor essentially has, you know. They're just sitting on an, on a, on a, on a contract uh, in anticipation of a conversion event that may or may not occur. Um, uh, convertible notes, on the other hand, uh, uh, to Larry's question, uh, I think are are maybe the more standard mechanism uh, because they are um, characterized as debt. They do have a maturity date. They do have an interest rate. It's just they have the ability to convert into equity at a future point in time. Um, so I think the vast majority of startups uh, financings that we see are, are in the convertible debt realm, um, but in an unsecured convertible debt. In other words, it, it doesn't have, uh, the, the, the lenders don't secure the assets of the company um, you know, relative to that debt. Now, um, you know, th there are other instruments, particularly for non-venture track companies, um, you know, that, that are in the consumer product realm that have good cash flow, but need financing. And, and so, you know, factoring or accounts, you know, you know, financing through through other types of means that are predicated on kind of future cash flow, I think can be very popular. But um, for the most part, I think, um, you know, when we look at startups, these startups are either pre revenue in the case of life sciences, or, you know, they may be software based, in which case, um, you know, the, 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 the analysis really relates to the total market, um, you know, and then the ability to scale to that market 
uh, and while maintaining attractive margins for, for software companies. So we don't see as much of the, of, of, of the alternative type financings uh, in, in the area of, of, of venture. Um, and then, you know, of course, there, there's the traditional priced rounds and, and the price grounds can be, you know, through, through, through equity, through, can be through common, it can be per, through preferred. Uh, one of the things, uh, you know, that, um, that I think is really exciting, again, about Pasadena, uh, the greater Pasadena area is that um, there are some really great folks, um, including, I think, Larry, who may be on this call and, and others who uh, have deep, deep experience in, in looking at startups and uh, investing in startups. And, and so, um, you know, they, they tend to have uh, their, their, their ear to the ground in terms of what, what the, you know, what, what, what makes the most amount of sense for a particular stage of the company. Um, and they're really collaborative in terms of trying to help the company out um, and, and rationalize a, a financing uh, pathway, uh, whether it's through, you know, uh, any of the mechanisms just mentioned, or, you know, sometimes it could be, you know, um, through, through other mechanisms such as, such as organic revenue. Uh, okay. So what are your thoughts on using crowdfunding to get your startup off the ground? Uh, will this help or hurt later when pursuing venture capital? A great question. And I think that um, crowdfunding is one of those really exciting areas that, um, um, that, uh, that we see more and more often, um, but, but it isn't, uh, it, it's not a, um, it's not a, uh, uh, it's not the it's not the only pathway, and so 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 just by way of background, what crowdfunding I think the question uh, is asking is, you know, there are now there are now um, these internet portals that basically allow companies to subscribe to those portals to attract um, you know uh, funding from a large base of of investors who maybe put in a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars, but over time and over a large number of investors you know, the, the numbers add up to a couple hundred thousand dollars to a couple million dollars um, so that the company will have um, the ability to, to pursue their business model or to build a product or to accelerate the growth of their existing products. And so um, in the past, crowdfunding was not really a viable option because um, it was difficult to, to reach out to that many, to that many potential investors. And also the, 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 the regulations were such that it was very difficult to onboard those investors, particularly if they didn't meet certain criteria relating to you know, their, their experience and, and their ability to, to make an investment. That has now changed and there's some wonderful portals that uh, you know, like WeFunder um, that uh, have, have, have really created a, an efficient pathway towards, towards raising um, funds. Um, that, you know, it, it's not without some challenges as well as opportunities. And, you know, a number of the companies I've worked with have done crowdfunding successfully. Um, I, I'd probably say that there are a couple of considerations in evaluating a crowdfunding, um, you know, pathway. The, the first of which would be um, that, uh, that there, are, there are portals that will, you know, help create the infrastructure to allow a company to do a, crowdfund, a crowdfunding uh, campaign. However, you know, they do take uh, a chunk uh, of, of not only the net proceeds, but sometimes they'll ask for money up front. It's also pretty, um, you know, it's, it's fairly, uh, you know, it's, it's not an uninvolved process to get the paperwork ready for a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and, and so there is some investment of time and capital, um, you know, required to, to establish a crowdfunding campaign. Um, and so, so the second then consideration before initiating or evaluating is, determining realistically, are there potential investors who would want to fund that particular project? Um, and so um, some of the projects that I've seen done well, um, you know, there are a couple of companies that have crowdfunding that, uh, that, I've, that I've worked with that were on Shark Tank, right? And so Shark Tank was like a very nice way to get a lot of publicity for that particular product. They were all in the consumer product realm. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, and then to launch a crowdfunding campaign on the heels of that, um, there was you know enough branding or recognition of that company and or product to, to be able to to attract investors to, to make uh, to make investments. In the absence of that, though, you know I've seen other companies who may not have a particular brand or a particular uh, product that is well known struggle because um, you know a, a, an average investor is looking at hundreds of these types of opportunities, and if something doesn't really resonate with them personally or from an investment perspective. You know, it's, it can be difficult to, to raise that capital. 
I think another consideration that um, that is starting to get navigated is that you know there was some aversion to having crowdfunding in, in the past, particularly as it impacted the capitalization table of the company or who are the owners of the company. And so, um, so you know, for example, if a venture capital firm was looking at a company that had raised crowdfunding and now they look at um, you know hundreds of shareholders, if not thousands of shareholders, on the capitalization table. It creates a, a, a number of logistical challenges. The first of which is just you know getting every time you, you know every time the company needs a shareholder vote, having to notice out to, to the shareholders. Um, also, you know if if um, if if there are too many shareholders, or if the, if if a shareholder base exceeds a certain threshold, is deemed to be a public company, therefore subject to the reporting requirements as a public company, and so that creates a lot of um, expense, un, un, unwanted expense. Um, you know, the third is that um, there's also a perception that if if the um, uh, if if the if the crowd if the percentage of the crowdfunding um, investors are significant, that they may have the ability to block material events of the company, like subsequent you know um, financings, the ability to sell the company, that kind of thing. Um, and the fourth is um, sometimes the the crowdfunding valuation is higher than what a VC is, is comfortable investing in after, after the crowdfunding is completed. And so it can be an uncomfortable situation if let's say, you know, the company raises funds at a $10 million pre-money valuation or the company's worth $10 million at the time of crowdfunding and a VC comes back and says, okay, well, six months in, we only think you're worth 5 million bucks. And so, um, so there are different, you know, there are different logistical challenges associated with crowdfunding, but it, it's something that, you know, I think every entrepreneur who is looking at evaluating funding should look at and evaluate uh, on its merits relative to other opportunities in front of him or her. Um, do you have any tips for first time founders that are looking to get funding to launch their company? You know, that is a really good question. And, and, uh, you know, perhaps a final question to the extent that there, there aren't any others in, in the queue. Um, I, I'd say from a very broad perspective, um, you know, and, and um, you know, innovation is all about people and capital, right, at, at, at its heart. And it's, 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 it's being able to provide that connective tissue that puts, pe you know, people with great ideas and, and capital who wish to, who believe in those ideas. And so, um, so, so at, at its heart, the strength of the idea will drive the ability to get funding or to get capital, but it, it's a it's a long road. I mean, I think for many entrepreneurs um, who um, are looking to try to you know get their first round of funding, um, it, you know we see so many data points in the news about how this particular company raised five hundred million dollars, or or this particular twenty year old just you know uh, their their the valuation of their company is now a billion dollars and so so we tend to anchor on those data points uh, and 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 with with the belief that those actually are, are what 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 the market you know it, what is what is what is normal in the market um, but as many things are i mean the, they tend to be the outliers it's not to say that there aren't many many companies including within the greater pasadena area in los angeles that have exactly those types of profiles um, but I think for for um, for startups, um, for any kind of startup, a person with a great idea, it, it, it's really um, uh, you know that that individual's belief in that that idea, that that I, the 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 ability to create a product or or service out of that idea that can generate revenue, uh, and then the ability to convince um, people who have money to invest in that idea in the long run. And so I think those fundamental things haven't changed probably since the beginning of entrepreneurship. And so, um, so I think that um, first and foremost, it's really about, you know, um, is this something that you really believe in? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, th there may be a number of, of Pasadena angels on, 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 this, uh, on this webinar. Um, I, you know, I think I, I can't underemphasize how important it is about the person who is leading that company and, and, and the ability of the investor to have faith in that person and to believe in that person's vision. I think first and foremost, um, you know, it's really, what is that person's vision? Um, what is that person's ability to, to create a team that believes in that vision? And what is the ability to execute on that idea? I think that's maybe first and foremost. Um, now, you know, obviously there's a chicken and the egg situation, which is you can have a great team, you can have a great idea, you can have a great, Entre, uh, founder, but without capital, you know that's the fuel in which to to make 
to make the dream realized. And so, um, you know, there, there's no necessarily easy solution. I think there, there can be challenges associated with trying to pitch an idea to a venture capitalist or to an angel investor. Uh, nowadays, VCs and angels are, are swamped with so many different um, businesses that are, that are revenue, post-revenue, that, that they really have to evaluate, um, you know, uh, what, what, what types of companies can they invest in because there's a limited amount of capital, even though it may seem like there's an unlimited amount of capital, uh, every investor has to make, has to allocate their capital based on a particular investment thesis and particularly at the early stage, which is the, the angel stage and sometimes the series seed stage, there's an expectation that um, they will have to deploy capital into many different companies with knowing that a number of those companies, if not the majority of them, are not going to return their money back. So, so they, then they have to find a company that will return not, not just their money back, but a multiple of their money back. Uh, and that's just kind of the, the, the average, um, you know, that's kind of the averaging out of, of an investment um, um, uh, thesis from, a, from an investor perspective. So just bear that in mind that just, you know, once you have a great idea, a great team and a great product, try to do as much as you can to build that product, to get customers to buy it, um, and, and if you're showing metrics where customers believe in it, um, where, you know, um, where, where you're starting to see revenue, um, uh, and, and it may not necessarily be profit, but revenue, um, and you feel like in order to accelerate that revenue pathway, um, you need to attract outside capital, then by all means evaluate, um, you know, lines of credit if you can. Um, you know, uh, uh, friends and family tend to be the most, um, you know, the, 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 the low hanging fruit because they believe in you as a person. Um, angel investors, I think there's a very a great ecosystem here in the greater Pasadena area of angel investors, uh, whether they're the Pasadena angels, the tech post angels, or just um, super angels in, in the ecosystem. Uh, I think that's been aided also by the fact that we're now in a virtual environment. So it's not just angels within our geographic area, but angels throughout the United States and sometimes the world. Um, and, um, and then, you know, uh, uh, you know, to the extent that you can, you know, try to minimize your, 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 um, your burn so that the money that you raise allows you to get to that next, next inflection point, because there are very, there, there tends to be specific metrics that VCs will look at before they can cut a bigger check on the heels of an angel investment or on the heels of a friends and family round. So just have that kind of in the back of your head knowing that if, if you go out to 100 angels or 100 VCs and you know 99 of them say too early, it's not necessarily anything negative about your company. It just means that they're evaluating many, many different companies and just stay in touch with them, you know, continue to show that you're creating traction, that your team is together, that your product is, is, is really getting res is really resonating with, with your, with your uh, customer audience. Um, and the timing will, will, will make itself no, over time. I think that's an excellent, uh, that's an excellent piece of advice to end on. Um, and wow, we've learned a lot today. Thank you so much for all of your insight and all of your tips and, and you know, advice. Um, I think we've gone through all of our questions from the audience, unless anyone has anything last minute, just going a few minutes over here. But I am also reminded we do have several investors in our audience right now, uh, members of Pasadena Angels. And so I'm reminded by them that the Pasadena Angels are always happy to review business and funding plans. So you can go to their website and reach out directly there, or you can reach out to Innovate Pasadena and we're happy to get you connected to the Pasadena Angels um, and get you started. So definitely there are tons of resources here in Pasadena. I think this is a fantastic place for startups. Um, as Ken was mentioning, you know, a lot of, a lot of good action here, um, great industries and a lot of startups um, that are spinning up even now. Any last, uh, last words for our audience before we sign off? No, very well said, Beth. I, I agree 100% with, with, your, with your sentiment. I think that one of the things that's so magical about the greater Pasadena, uh, Pasadena um, area is, is that are the people, right? And, and these are people who are really passionate about helping. And, and, and you see that reflected through all the members of Innovate Pasadena, through all the members of Pasadena Angels and, and, you know, and, and all the nonprofits that are here and, and, uh, and, and you know, the angel investors who are here 
that really want to help and, and really want to help grow the region, want to help um, you know entrepreneurs of all ages, you know achieve their achieve their dreams. And so, and the nice thing about organizations like Innovate Pasadena and the Pasadena Angels is what I've found as a transplant from the Midwest is that they're they're very open and they're very helpful. And, and so um, I don't think that um, that um, that that if you don't have that, then it's very difficult to become, you know, to have a viable ecosystem. So, you know, th thanks to thanks for everyone on, on this line and, and in the community who who make that happen for the entrepreneurial uh, community. Thank you so much for joining us today and for all that you've shared. Um, Ken Punahashi, Wilson Sosini, and uh, recent addition to the Innovate Pasadena Board of Directors. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thanks for organizing. Have a great week.